Hi, I'm Old North Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. Now I promise I'll get right back to the great outdoors of Colorado here in just a minute, but I wanted to show you something indoors first. When my Patreon supporters first made it clear that uh, a video about the Old Norse calendar uh, was going to be something I couldn't escape making because so many of them requested it, I knew that I was probably going to disappoint people because I don't think there is any way to make a calendar, right, in the sense that we think of that as a physical object or something perhaps uh, on our phones or computers. Right, today, if you and I are going to meet at some particular time or something, we can say, meet me on this day of this month, right, the sec uh, this is open to November, whatever. Uh, we can meet, say we're going to meet the 2nd of November or something like that. And there's other kinds of information about different days. Like I see, for example, that's All Souls Day, all right? Uh, the next day after that is Election Day, uh, Veterans Day is a little bit after that, etc. And we can all kind of agree on when those specific days are, uh, if we observe them, uh, or if they're applicable in our country or whatever. But you're not going to find much disagreement from place to place or person to person about when November 2nd is or something like that. I really don't think that you can set up a system like that for the Norse, especially the pre-Christian Norse. Once the Norse are converted to Christianity, yes, to a certain extent, they're incorporated into um, a very consistent calendar system, but that's the church's larger European calendar, and then at that point, you're not really finding uh, quote-unquote native cultural information. What I'm going to try to do in this video is not then construct some kind of calendar that, again, you can hang up on your wall Right, and scribble dates and say, well, this is going to be on, you know, <laughs> Thor month 10 or something, because uh, I don't think you can do that. But instead to look at how the Norse viewed seasons, months, which of course are really literally moons, uh, and what little we can eke out of our genuine Old Norse sources about holidays. As mentioned in the intro in the Utah Raptor Room, today on my Patreon-supported series of videos about Norse language and myth, I'll be talking about the Norse calendar, which I really should put in scare quotes. Rather, it's the Norse uh, conception of months and holidays and time passing. At least what information we can get about this from Old Norse sources. Now, if you search online or um, in um, maybe some old-fashioned books going back to some 19th century mystic books, you're going to find a fair amount of stuff about Norse holidays, about Norse time reckoning, that really has no basis whatsoever in our medieval sources. This is not an uncommon problem in Norse studies where people find gaps and start filling them in. Uh, certainly what I have found in uh, my reading about this has been not very satisfying in a lot of ways, but uh, I'm used to that, of course, <laughs> having a PhD in Old Norse. You get used to uh, the answer to all your questions, or most of your questions being, oh, there isn't an answer. Uh, but let's start with what Snorri Sturluson himself says in his prose Edda about the reckoning of time. We read, using uh, reconstructed Old Norse pronunciation from about his time, which sounds pretty different from modern Icelandic pronunciation. Fro javendugri er haust til þess er sól setsk í uikvarstað. Tho er vetter til javendugris, tho er vor til fardaga, tho er summar til javendugris. Haust mónudur heitir in nætti fyrir vetter, fyrstur í vetri heitir gór mónudur, tho er frer mónudur, tho er hrut mónudur, tho er þori, tho gói, tho ein mónudur, Tho geuk monudur, og so tíð, tho egg tíð og stek tíð, tho er sól monudur og sel monudur, tho er hoyanir, tho er kornskurðar monudur. So from the even days, from the equinox, is autumn until the sun sets in the place of the sun at Uyt, so when the sun sets at about 3 p.m. 
And then it is winter until the next equinox. Then it is spring until moving days. Then it is summer until the equinox. Now here he's stating a four season system uh, that corresponds pretty closely with the calendar used in most of Christian Europe. Uh, in fact, the Norse frequently just talk about summer and winter, summer and vetter, with summer and winter uh, being roughly six month periods. Uh, the first day of summer is in April. It is the first day of the new moon in what we would call April. And then winter is starts on the first day of the new moon in what we would call October. The Norse are capable of talking about spring and autumn, uh, as Snorri does here, but they don't have to. They're not, they're, they're extra details about the time of year that they don't have to include. They don't have the same uh, high level status uh, as the summer and winter designations. It's kind of like if you ask me if I have a dog, uh, I might say yes. And then you might ask me what kind of dog and I might say golden retriever or something. Summer is the broader category uh, of which spring is a smaller transitional part. I hope that sums it up well. So then he gives us some month names. He says host monitor, harvest month or autumn month. That would be from roughly uh, mid-September to mid-October. Now keep in mind month, monitor in Old Norse is based on the word moni, moon, just like the English word month is based on the word moon. And to them, the month is actually the moon. Now, that does get uh, spun off of the, uh, the solar year, of course, because uh, the lunar month is about, I think it's 29 and a half days. So eventually you're going to have to catch up. But for just general daily reckoning among an agricultural people, this works fairly well. So, and, and keep in mind, of course, in English, we say the exact same thing, harvest a moon, right? Uh, there's also the one after that, which is the hunter's moon, and occasionally, and there's also all kinds of English folklore names for, for the various moons or months. Um, and then, of course, there's the blue moon, when you have a moon inside of the same calendar month. So we kind of have relics of a time when we reckon by moons, too. But for them, the month is, is the moon. Basically, the new moon is the moon being born, and then it grows up into the full moon, and then it decays and dies, and then another moon is born. Anyway, so house one of would be roughly our September, October. Then you have Gore Monother, that's Gore month, so called because about this time of year you start slaughtering more animals that you don't want to feed through the winter. That would be roughly our October, November. And then Frer Monother, that would be roughly our November, December, that's frozen month. Makes sense, you're going to probably start seeing the first freezes around then. Then Hrut Monother is ram month. This is roughly our December, January. This is when rams are bred with the ewes in medieval Iceland. Then Thori, this is roughly our January, February. This means something like diminishing. Uh, it does have a, sub, a, uh, a superficial resemblance to the name Thor. And of course, today in Iceland, um, Thorablot is often celebrated during the month of Thori. Um, and it's kind of a Viking themed uh, big party. It's roughly the halfway point of winter uh, when the month of Thori begins. Today, that's the Friday between January 19th and 25th. Um, but it is not related to the name of Thor. It's related to um, actually the verb thera to diminish. So probably because food stores are diminishing at this time. Then there's Goi. That would be roughly our February, March. That's a old, a very archaic uh, word related to snow. And then the month roughly corresponding to March, April, Ein uh, that would be loan month. Not sure exactly why. Then roughly corresponding to April, May is Geuk Molnuthur, that's cuckoo month. Now I checked and the cuckoo is not found in Iceland, but it is found in Norway, uh, where of course this calendar was probably used before it was brought to Iceland. Then you have one month that is called by three names, Sotid, seed time, egg time, egg teeth, and stek teeth. And then you have another month called sol monitor, sun month, or seal month. So this would be roughly, uh, let's see, if sol teeth, egg teeth, uh, stek teeth is May, June, then this uh, sol monitor, sun month, 
or uh, sell one of their, that's mountain pastures for sheep where they're driven during the summer. Uh, that would be roughly uh, our uh, June, July. And then uh, July, August, Huyanir, haying time. And then Korn, Skurdar, Monother. This is the reaping time, the reaping month. All right. But probably this is not particularly, say, scientific. Um, people can roughly say what what month it is by what moon it is and what the temperature and such is like uh, and because they keep track of which ones come after which ones and there's probably different month names observed in different places and times i don't think these had uh, legal uh, canonized reality but uh, based on snorri these are real names for uh, the months at least in uh, early iceland now they are observing the moon as a way of telling time as i mentioned the new moon is when uh, one month ends and another one begins. But they don't call that the new moon, they call that nid. Uh, so for example, you have compounds like Old Norse, nidamirkr, meaning the darkness at new moon, the darkness without a moon. The full moon, contra our practice, is what's called ni, literally new. Uh, and then you, and you can see that in compounds like ni lisi, the light of the full moon, when you can sail. And if you look at Volspa stanza six, uh, we see these uh, indicated among other ways of telling time the gods established early on. Not ok nidium novum um govu, morgen hetu ok midian dag, undorn ok aftan orum atelia. They gave names to the night and to the new moons, right? Names probably similar to the ones uh, we just reviewed from Snorri. They named the morning and the middle day, the afternoon and the evening, in order to tell the years. We don't know a lot about the holidays practiced by the pre-Christian Norse. We know a lot about the holidays practiced by the Christian Norse because, of course, most of the medieval writings about calendars and such are to help people figure out uh, church holidays. We look at things like the Old Norse Reimboigla, which goes back to the 1100s, or the Mesu Skiring Ok Alratida, the explanation of mass in all times, which is from the manuscripts AM 625 quarter from the 1300s. These are for explaining and figuring out when to hold church holidays. It's mostly in the sagas that we have anything written about the old pagan holidays, because of course the sagas often take place in that pre-Christian period, but we can't always tell that these are uh, described in a realistic way by the people writing about them 200 years after the conversion. Um, some that we know about uh, from the sagas include Yol or Yule, the uh, holiday around the uh, winter solstice. Uh, I've discussed that a fair amount in another video. Uh, that is the holiday that we know the most about. I'll refer you to that other video. If you are watching this on YouTube on a laptop in 2020, you ought to see a card on the top right of the screen that takes you straight there. Otherwise, it's not hard to find on my channel. Um, there may also have been a corresponding holiday around the longest day of the year, uh, so what we would call late June. Uh, to judge from later Icelandic folklore traditions, there might have been a sense that this day, which is almost all light, there's almost no night in, in Iceland or northern Norway or Sweden, uh, that reality's walls were especially thin. Uh, we have later folkloric stories about seals turning into people uh, on this day uh, and people searching for uh, magic stones that ease women's labor on that day. That may go back to pre-Christian uh, traditions. And then following that, uh, you have the hardest working couple months of the year, right? The, the, the late summer, early fall from our perspective. Uh, this is the haymaking season, when in fact people are working so hard that uh, the early uh, law code, Jonsbok in Iceland from the late 1200s, actually forbids people from being subpoenaed during this period because everybody's so hard at work. Presumably, again, based on later folklore traditions in Iceland, there was probably some celebration at the end of this haymaking season. Uh, major festivals in mid-September also probably for the sheep roundup, which continue in modern Iceland. There's another holiday called Vetternatr, Winter Nights, which is mentioned in the saga of Gisli and in Lakstila saga. 
for instance, in Gisli's Saga, chapter 10. Tat vartho margra manasidr at fagna vetri itan tima, ok havatho vetslur, ok vetr not ablot. It was the custom of many men at the time to welcome winter in that time and to have, at that time, feasts and the sacrifice of the winter nights. This is in the concept context of Gisli abandoning the animal sacrifice because he's not a good pagan. He's one of these pre-Christian godless men, but he keeps having feasts at this time. And then again in chapter 15 of that saga, Thorgrimur atladi at hava heusbod ok fagna vetri ok blota frori. Thorgrimur intended to have the, um, the autumn feast and to welcome the winter and to sacrifice to Freuer. And this is a big feast with straw on the benches as the fanciest events in their times are. Now, uh, the Veternatra, the Winter Nights, these are the two nights between the end of summer and the beginning of winter. So there, it's, those, it's the two transitional nights, the last of, of the summer, remember, with summer and winter being the two divisions of the year, and the beginning of winter. So this is then in mid-October. Today in Iceland, it is the Saturday between October 21st and 27th, is what it's standardized out as. Popular time for weddings because meat is available. Remember that around here is the month, this is just before the month called Gormonada or, or Gore month because it's when you're slaughtering your animals. And also Icelandic folklore from later prescribes this is a good time for reading omens about the coming winter out of the spleens of the sheep slaughtered at this time. So that could be a pre-Christian tradition. There are various traditions associated with the uh, mid-winter months of Thori and Goi. As I mentioned, Thora bloat, the sacrifice of Thori, on the, uh, when the month Thori begins, uh, is uh, still popular today. It's also called Bonda Dagr today, Farmer Day. And uh, there's some evidence from Icelandic folklore tradition that there was a tradition of feeding ravens at this time. And then there is uh, Goi, which has a corresponding Goa bloat. Uh, this is now standardized as the Sunday between February 18th and 24th in Iceland. This goes back to um, early stories of Thori and Goi as personified beings. And um, well, here's what we read in a little story called Fundin Norregur. Norway is found in the manuscript Flatire book from the uh, early 1300s. Dotir Hans het Goi. Thori var blot mother Mikkel. Han have the blot o hueri ori at midium vetri. That colludu ther thora bloat. Av thwi tok monodrin heiti. That var tithenda ein vetter a thora bloati, at goi huarvi brot, ok var hennar leita farit, ok finsk hon egi. Ok er so monodur lei, let thori fo at bloati, ok blota tel thes er ther urdi visir, huar goi veri nether komen. That colludu ther goi bloat. So his daughter, Thori's daughter, was named Goi. Uh, and Thori was a great man of sacrifices, he sacrificed quite a bit in pagan tradition. He had a sacrifice every year at the middle of winter, and they called it Thori's sacrifice, Thora Blow. From that, the month took its name. And it was, and it so happened one winter, at, during Thora Blow, that Goi disappeared, and uh, they searched for her and did not find her, and as the month passed, uh, Thori let, or had another sacrifice performed, and sacrificed uh, so they would become aware of where Goi had, had died, where her body was, and they called that Goi bloat. But nothing else that Goi bloat is told. In Icelandic tradition, uh, men are supposed to be extra good to their wives at the beginning of Goi, and women are supposed to be extra good to their husbands at the start of Thori. Uh, no telling if that goes back to pagan times or if that's a later tradition. But there's also something kind of similar, because on the first day of summer, by the way, uh, which is uh, now standardized as the Thursday between April 19th and 25th, boys just be extra nice to girls. But then on the first day of Ain Monother, which is now standardized as the Tuesday between March 20th and 26th, girls are supposed to be extra nice to boys. Who knows how much of this goes back to the pagan period. So I know this is a little bit disappointing given that I know that what people want to do is be able to make a Norse calendar they can hang on their wall and be able to express dates in an equivalent but different way to the calendar we're used to today. People want to say, you know, the first day of the month of Thor in the year of, you know, the year, the year 1349 and of 
Anno Thori or whatever, right? That's what people want, I think, when they ask about the Norse calendar, and we just don't have that. And I doubt they had a system uh, that detail where you could really even say uh, March 1st, 2020 in a way that was equivalent to March 1st, 2021, but different with respect to the year. I think they knew the months. I think they knew roughly where they were in a month, but that literally meant moon. And they knew the agricultural activities associated with that moon. I think that they could tell you that it was, say, the fourth winter in which so-and-so had been reigning in Norway. But I just don't think that they had the kind of systematic, detailed, day-by-day, year-to-year calendar that, uh, that we're used to today. And that's fine. They didn't need it, right? This is an agricultural society for the most part. Knowing when you do what on the farm or aboard ship is what's more important. There's not a professional class of historians. Uh, there's not much need to talk about, um, you know, what happened in 2014, say, uh, rather than just say, oh, six winters ago. So, you know, we need to sometimes relax a little bit and say, this information is just not there, probably never existed, and our sources are very limited. And that's part of appreciating uh, the real study of Norse language, mythology, and culture is knowing where we just have to use our imaginations a little bit, maybe have fun with doing that, but acknowledge the limits of our sources. For now, I thank you as always for your time. I thank you for your Patreon support. And from beautiful Colorado, let me wish you all the best. The whole point of this video channel, the whole point of my books is to bring good information about these subjects to the people who want it in the places where they're looking for it online. Otherwise, the people who know what they're talking about are all trying to impress each other, talking to each other in the ivory tower, and they're never reaching out to the public. The people who are reaching out to the public on YouTube or wherever else mostly are scared, angry people trying to, to, to spread centuries-old cartoonish uh, racialist theories. And, and crazy mysticism that has nothing to do with our medieval sources. I want to bring good information about our real medieval sources straight to you in the places where you're looking for it, without an agenda, without trying to set myself up as some ivory tower super genius who's better than you. You can help me do that by donating small monthly amounts on my Patreon. And everyone who does that has my everlasting thanks for your incredible generosity and the way that you helped me make a university of uh, my favorite place in the world, the great Rocky Mountain outdoors. Well, from now, from the middle of beautiful Colorado, let me wish you good thinking, good skepticism, and all the very best.